So, Louisa and I will be talking about pain management in neurology today. First, I'll go through the pathophysiology of pain, and then I'll talk about opioids and the current opioid crisis. And then I'm going to go into the literature on alternate pain management options for both acute and chronic pain in neurology. Pain itself arises from nociceptors. And this can be stimulated from noxious or um, bothersome stimuli, or it can be from inflammatory mediators such as prostaglandins or cytokines. Mm -hmm. There are multiple inputs. They can be somatic or visceral inputs, and these are all integrated to create the perception of pain in an individual. And what the inflammatory mediators do is it decreases the nociceptor activation thresholds, so less noxious signals or less tissue damage can cause pain. Important to note is that some of the brainstem nuclei send descending impulses that release GABA and also endogenous opioids to the dorsal horn and the spinal cord, and this causes an inhibition of nociception. There are three types of pain. The first type, nociceptive pain, is caused by the direct stimulation of nociceptors in response to a tissue injury. For example, this would be skin or MSK pain from surgical trauma, or it could be distension of hollow organs such as from a full bladder or inflammation of the urogenital system. This pain is typically sharp or throbbing in character, and it is the quote-unquote normal response to a painful stimulus. Acetaminophen works as a central antinociceptive by stimulating inhibitory parts of the spinal cord, and opioids, whether endogenous or administered prescription opioids, hyperpolarize the nociceptors, and this causes um, decreased activation of them. The second type of pain, neuropathic pain, is caused by a lesion or a disruption of the nervous system. This could be through a spinal cord injury or diabetic uh, neuropathy, for example. The pain is typically described as burning or tingling in character and can also manifest as a hypersensitivity to pain. Gabapentinoids, such as gabapentin or pregabalin, are commonly used to treat neuropathic pain. And also tricyclic antidepressants and SNRIs enhance the descending inhibition of nociceptin and are also used to treat neuropathic pain. The third type is inflammatory pain, and this again is caused by inflammatory mediators such as prostaglandin and various cytokines, which are released at and around the site of tissue inflammation. NSAIDs have an anti-inflammatory effect by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis by FOX. So why do we care about pain? Pain has many deleterious effects, causes sympathetic discharge, various neurohormonal changes, can cause respiratory complications from splinting, and can cause an unhappy, uncooperative, or combative patient. Um, WHO kind of grew the idea that pain is the fifth vital sign. How we measure pain can sometimes be difficult. Pain is a subjective experience, but for clinical and research purposes, it's usually quantified on various scales, the most common being the visual analog scale, or the numeric rating scale, or the verbal assessment, Typically, 0 to 10, 10 being the most pain, 0 being no pain at all. In the VGHPAR, a uh, score of 3 or less is needed to be discharged from the um, PAR, and nurses are instructed to treat patients if they have a pain score of greater than 3. Next, I'll talk about opioids and opioid crisis. Opioids are medications that bind receptors for the prevention and treatment of pain. It's really become one of the mainstays for treatment. They're the fourth most dispensed class of drug after antihypertensive drugs, antidepressants, and statins, which is pretty remarkable. And we're all familiar with and prescribe many of these opioids on a weekly, if not daily basis. And not all of these need to be prescribed on the triplicate, but doesn't mean they're not opioids. However, these opioids have many side effects, nausea, vomiting, pruritus, confusion, respiratory de um, depression, and um, importantly, prescription drug um, use, abuse, and addiction are truly debilitating iatrogenic illnesses. So where did this all begin? In, 19, in the 1980s, the WHO developed the analgesic ladder as a guideline for treatment of cancer pain, 
and this was in response to numerous epidemiological studies that found that cancer patients were not um, receiving adequate pain relief. So these guidelines help to facilitate and also legitimize the use of strong opioids for patients with advanced cancer. However, um, in the 1990s, there was a push by the Joint Commission in the USA that advocated for the use of opioid therapy for chronic non-cancer pain, and then hospitals, facilities all had to comply in order to get um, accreditation. This push was led by multiple physicians that were not surprisingly involved with big pharma. And this increased prescription of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain led to widespread misuse before the addictive nature of the drugs was truly evident, especially because a lot of the companies tried to hide this. And the current uh, opioid epidemic was one of the worst um, in history. So, a couple of stats on the opioid crisis. Uh, about 6% of opioid-naive adult patients undergoing surgery become chronic opioid users. There was um, a study at the Mayo Clinic, and that suggested that most urology patients, about 80%, were considered opioid naive, so this is very relevant to our population. 40% um, of opioid deaths involve prescription opioids. This may not necessarily affect BC specifically because of the fentanyl crisis going on. And interestingly, refill rates are higher in patients that receive more opioids at discharge. So there's a lot of attention on opioids in the news right now. Just this Sunday, actually, Purdue Pharma, which is the maker of OxyContin, oxycodone, um, filed for bankruptcy to wipe out about 2,000 lawsuits claiming that the company fueled the opioid et epidemic by illegally pushing sales of oxycodone, mostly by downplaying or hiding its addictive potential. Earlier this month, there was a article published in JAMA. Uh, it said that Canadians are much more likely to fill opioid prescriptions post-op compared to US and Sweden. So Canada is in the purple, US is in the blue, Sweden is in the red, and it is quite remarkable how much more uh, Canadians tend to fill prescriptions. And from the same study, I thought it was pretty interesting that Canada, the first column, prescribes proportionally a lot more tramisets and Tylenol-3 compared to the U.S. and Sweden. And I think a lot of the residents in the room probably write these prescriptions again on a daily basis. The next thing I'm going to talk about is opioid reduction. There is a AUA position statement on opioid use and essentially it recommends only use of opioids when necessary. And the um, there's a study in Michigan and they came up with something that lists the suggested amount of opioids. So it's trying to promote a reasonable prescription based on the surgery, and that's procedure-specific pro uh, prescribing recommendations. It's mostly general surgery procedures they have on here at the moment, but there is prostatectomies, and it suggests zero to 10 five milligram oxycodone tablets for management of post-operative pain. And these recommendations are specifically for the average patient with no preoperative use of opioids. Pardon me? <laughs> Probably both. There's a, I'll talk about that later as well. And the other thing for opioid therapy is the use of uh, multimodal therapies to try and spare opioids, which is going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. And the last point, educational interventions being effective. Um, there's been studies done showing that both provider and patient educational intervention results in significant reduction in opioid prescribing without necessarily changing patient satisfaction with pain control. Not necessarily in a urology population, but in a surgical population, so that's something to note. And there was also a um, CUAJ article published a while back that said there was a lack of knowledge and training in pain management in urology resident programs. And this was done at, I think, one of the quests um, a number of years ago. So it's a matter of um, education and um, kind of just thinking about this topic. So with that, I'm going to review current literature on first methods of pain management during um, urologic procedures causing acute pain. First, flexible cystoscopy. We don't, we don't necessarily think of it as a very painful 
thing, but I'll start with that. For uh, office cystoscopies, intraurethral lidocaine, there is a lot of good evidence coming from meta-analysis from 12 RCTs suggesting that um, your jet's intraurethral lidocaine can significantly um, reduce pain scores. Mm -hmm. The benefit is better with a longer dwell time. And because it's so effective, there's not much other literature on other methods for pain management for it. But there was one study that looked at distraction methods, so a video or music playing or a stress ball, and that also helped to lower anxiety. Uh, the effect was most pronounced in the video group because I guess that was the most distracting. Next, I'll talk about acute renal colic, which is a prototypical pain condition. Acute urinary tract obstruction causes intense visceral nociception from increased distension of the renal pelvis and ureter, and this is secondary to increased intraluminal pressure. And what this does is it increases renal prostaglandins, which further mediates an increase in renal blood flow and diuresis with this rising pressure, so it's a bit of a vicious cycle. And a recent meta-analysis in this year published found that NSAIDs were actually superior for the management of acute renal colic. Likely, the effect was mediated by a reduction in renal blood flow and diuresis. Diclofenac, Torlac, and ibuprofen, um, compared to whether it was opioids or combination therapy, decreased pain at 30 minutes and also had decreased adverse events or side effects. For those patients where only NSAIDs wasn't enough, um, combination therapy was helpful for the in uncontrolled pain. So the result of this large meta-analysis did not really advocate the use of opioids for acute renal colic. Next, for um, shockwave uh, lithotripsy, they looked at the intracutaneous injection of sterile water. That has mostly before this been used for um, laboring mums. The evidence for that wasn't great, but um, this RCT showed that during SWAL, it decreased the need for rescue analgesia, so needing to give opioids afterwards. And because it was opioid sparing, it decreased adverse events. It was the only study on this. And again, in the, um, in the OBSGAIN literature, it's not very strongly advocated for. So I just as a sham placebo? Um, well, in laboring moms, they in inject it into the scrotum, not scrotum, sacrum, <laughs> sacrum, and then it's almost, a, as you said, placebo or distraction method, but the results were pretty, pretty equivocal from those. So here again, I think it's um, more of a distraction method than anything. <laughs> They'll stop thinking about the knee pain. <laughs> and I'll talk about ureteroscopies next. There was uh, one re retrospective review on prescription data on patients who underwent ureteroscopy. This is the point of this study was to look at pre versus uh, post-operative opioid exposure. And more than 60% of patients received pre-operative opioid prescriptions within 30 days before they underwent the uroscopy. And this often was from multiple providers and multiple prescriptions from multiple bounce backs. 12% uh, of patients required additional uh, opioid prescriptions within 30 days after the ureteroscopy, even after the stone was treated. And still 7% required additional opioids 60 days after the stone was treated. The study found that there are significant associations with preoperative opioid exposure. And then there was associations with, again, the number of prescriptions, the number of days prescribed, and number of unique providers that provided the opioids. So more opioids before, more opioids used after. Yes, Connor. Are these the types of acid that's supposed to be used? Are these not complicated ureteroscopy, or is it all patients with ureteroscopies? I think there's stented ureteroscopy specifically, but relatively uncomplicated. Another study looked at was sort of a feasibility study. Can we can we manage um, stone patients without opioids? So they looked at 
um, diclofenac versus oxycodone in patients undergoing, again, stented <coughs> ureteroscopy. And there was no difference at all in the rate of post-operative pain issues. So there was no difference in the number of patients who needed additional prescriptions no difference in the number of patients who called afterwards saying they were in pain, no difference in patient satisfaction between NSAIDs versus opioids, suggesting that maybe patients don't need opioids after. I think I think for this study, the only things they received were other than like Tylenol Advil were diclofenac or oxycodone. Next, there's, there were a couple of studies looking at intraluminal lidocaine installation during ureteroscopy. The first pilot trial done a couple years ago, um, it didn't have a control, and it reported that 60% didn't require um, post-operative IV analgesic, so they classified that as a success. Um, but a RCT done, I think, at Queen's a couple years ago um, with the actual comparison group, placebo, showed that there was no difference at any point between the intervention and placebo groups, suggesting that this doesn't actually work very well. Next, I'll talk about um, percutaneous nephrolithotomies. The most literature was on not bupivacaine or um, local infiltration directly into the nephrostomy tract and both studies I found suggested that um, doing this would decrease pain scores and decrease narcotic usage. And the only other thing I found for percutaneous was electroacupuncture. Small study suggesting that um, a hour of electroacupuncture before the procedure decreased pain score at all time periods and decrease mean, mean cumulative opioid um, usage. Not necessarily available at every center, but it's an option, I guess. Next, I'll talk about some of the bigger procedures. So the TAP block, the transverse abdominal plane block, I'm sure we've all seen. The one thing about the TAP block to consider is that the effect is apparently limit, limited to about 12 hours or so. So if there's ongoing pain, they need something longer lasting. But there was a study looking at TAP block versus um, epidural in patients undergoing lap nephrectomies and no difference in pain scores or time of movement, time of first time mobilization. So comparable to epidurals um, with the added benefit that um, Patients with epidurals needed a Foley catheter for much longer. Also looked at Ketorolac and lap nephrectomies, and uh, they studied this often in uh, the donor nephrectomy group, actually. And uh, one of the big concerns about Ketorolac is bleeding, and then the study found there was no difference in post-op hemoglobin levels between the patients receiving a Ketorolac infusion or a placebo, just normal saline. And in both groups, there was a decrease in GFR over um, time over the 1.5 year follow-up, but there was no difference in GFR between groups, suggesting that Ketorolac um, infusion doesn't really affect um, the GFR when it's used for a brief period post-operatively. And there was a second study done a bit longer ago, but again reported no difference in creatinine blood loss transfusion rates between patients receiving a Ketorolac infusion versus just the placebo. This next one was pretty interesting. So again, looking at laparoscopic nephrectomies, the intervention was to practice the surgical position, so laparoscopic arms up, um, twice a day for three days before coming to the surgery versus patients who just come in and get positioned onto the table. And then there was no difference in the actual pain around the wound, not surprisingly, but there was reported a decreased low back pain and contralateral shoulder pain, which isn't the most significant contributor to pain, but part of it. Uh, pretty interesting. And now we'll talk about radical prostatectomies. So this study um, looked at all radical prostatectomies, so open versus robotic. And the point of this study was to kind of quantify how many opioids were being used. And um, similar to the ureteroscopy study, prescribing more opioids was independently associated with greater um, opioid use. 
they didn't find any difference in the amount of opioid use depending on the surgical approach, so it didn't matter if it was open versus robotic. And they actually didn't find a difference in opioid use with a history of pain-related diagnoses, for whatever that's worth. The kind of scary thing is that 77% um, of prescribed opioids were unused, and almost 10% of only 10% of these patients appropriately disposed of leftover opioids. So the remaining 90% just had these opioids at home, or they were possibly diverted somewhere else. Don't know, because most of these patients actually use less than half of the prescribed opioids. So this study kind of suggested that physicians were prescribing way more opioids than their patients actually needed. Another study again looked at tap lock um, in uh, prostatectomy, this time um, robotic, and the compared to control nothing, uh, the tap block decreased pain score, decreased the number of patients using opioids, had a shorter hospital stay, no complications. So it's a probably a viable option. I'm not sure how to explain that specifically. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if that would quantify numbers, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe, yeah, <laughs> early in the morning compared to later in the afternoon. Where I'm not sure the details of this. Uh, JN Neurology. I can't remember exactly which center right now, but I can remember. Yeah, but in Australia, this person lived in I'm pretty sure this is a US study, but. So in cystectomies, there was one study looking at lidocaine infusions versus placebo in patients undergoing an open round cystectomy. And there were decreased pain scores, decreased time to first latest, time to first PM, time to regular diet, most likely because opioid sparing, less than GI side effects, no difference in length of hospital stay. Another study looked at uh, Catorlac PCA versus a morphine PCA in patients undergoing radical cystectomy. And again, because of the opioid sparing, there was decreased um, time to flatus, time to BM, time to advancing diet, and again, no difference in length of hospital stay. And the uh, last study that wasn't in the literature yet, but was actually done at our center looking at rectus sheath catheters. Um, so they're placed at the time of the OR, and there's a bupivacaine infusion, um, the same rate as a continuous epidural, and the comparison was an epidural for patients undergoing radical cystectomy. Um, Dr. Tang from Anesthesia gave me the preliminary results, and it was a non-inferior study that said that rectus sheath catheters were non-inferior compared to the epidurals based on their preliminary analysis. Um, However, the epidural actually trended towards better analgesia, for whatever that's worth. Two patients who had the rectus sheath catheters actually needed to be converted to an epidural for uncontrolled post-op. And um, he noted that any history of abdominal surgery or radiation in the past makes the rectus sheath catheters ineffective, so it's not for everybody, but it's potentially a possible option. I have yet that's, to write up that study. That's a good example of a study that took a long time to do. Dr. Tang seemed displeased with his fellows. No, no, it's actually not. It's a judge and, oh, okay. uh, and uh, Bernard. Now, safely, uh, overseas. <laughs> okay, and um, I found one study on vasectomy, opioids versus no opioids in patients undergoing a clinical vasectomy. No difference in scrotal pain between patients who are prescribed opioids or not. Obviously, they had some other form of pain control, Tylenol NSAIDs.
they followed these patients for a while, and there was an incidence of new persistent opioid use, 7.8% in the opioid group compared to 1.5% in the control group. <laughs> Just a clinic vasectomy. Yeah, but again, this was definitely a U.S. study where they give, I think, more opioids. And the last one for acute pain, um, there was one study looking at, um, at implantation of inflatable penile prosthesis, and they compared a multimodal analgesic regimen with uh, multiple medications, including seminophen and intralocal local, versus none of that, and just opioids and um, patients undergoing a prosthesis. And they found the multimodal analgesic regimen was effective at post-op day zero, one, and at post-discharge, and not surprisingly, decreased opioid um, usage and actually had decreased post-operative pain sores compared to the patients only receiving opioids. So um, multiple methods, probably especially the intra-op local, which the opioid group did not receive, is helpful. Next, I'll talk about chronic pain in urology. Pain persisting after three months is typically classified as chronic. It's pretty poorly understood how chronic pain arises from a acute pain long after the initial inciting event is healed. There could be continued nociceptive input from processes like ongoing tissue inflammation or infection or nerve entrapment, but there also may be a pathologic activation of the CNS. With central sensitization, the responsiveness of neurons increase, leading to an activation of pain transmission by inputs that would normally be innocuous, allodynia, or it can lead to a heightened response to painful stimuli or hyperalgesia. And the one of the ways to manage that is the history, physical, rule, any organic causes, manage expectations that pain's not going to get better overnight. And uh, multimodal treatment, whether it's with um, various non-opioid sparing medications or psychotherapy, physical therapy are helpful. And another big focus in the literature is the use of a multidisciplinary approach and referred to a specialized pain clinic because it's not something easy to deal with. We'll talk about both chronic pelvic pain and uh, chronic scrotal pain. Chronic um, pelvic pain is something that affects in the literature about six to nine percent of um, our population within men and women and for a third of these individuals pain is moderate to severe and impacts their daily activities and quality of life. Dr. Nicolette Queens came out with the U-point clinical phenotypes, which helps um, direct multimodal therapy. So for patients with primary urinary symptoms are greater than 50, like they have BPH, it's suggested to give alpha blockers, 5-ARIs. If it's a psychosocial dominant phenotype, amitriptyline, and there's something organ specific, advocates for injection therapies. So ileal inguinal injection, periprostatic blocks, or pudendal, pudendal nerve blocks based on exactly where the pain is. Um, for patients with um, a history of infection or just any patient advocates for a trial at the very least of antibiotic therapy. If it fails after four weeks, there's no point in continuing. For neuropathic pain, there's the gabapentinoids, and for a kind of MSK type phenotype, there's muscle relaxants or physical therapy or biofeedback. And that's just a pictorial version of the U-point system. There was a big Cochrane review on specifically men with chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain. And what they found was acupuncture leads to a clinically significant reduction in prostate symptoms compared to just standard medical therapy. Another one of their big conclusions was that extracorporeal shockwave therapy also led to a significant reduction in prostate symptoms compared to controls. Um, less dramatic um, was physical activity which led to a small reduction in symptoms. And they also talked about transrectal thermotherapy which led to a small modest reduction in prostate symptoms. That was published this year. And they 
there was a RCT looking at shockwave therapy um, versus regular pharmacotherapy with an alpha blocker, anti-inflammatory muscle relaxant um, with patients with chronic pelvic pain. And it did decrease pain scores at four week and a 12 week follow up. Interestingly, no difference at all in um, PVR and flow rate. I'm not sure if these were necessarily urinary phenotype patients, but there you have it. And there's a couple of studies looking at intravesical lidocaine. So one looked at daily intravesical lidocaine installations for five days versus placebo. And there was about 30% with um, moderate improvement in pain and 9% with a marked improvement in pain after therapy. And there was a pilot study, very small numbers, but this used a continuous lidocaine releasing system for two weeks in patients um, with um, chronic pelvic pain. And um, after the two weeks, there was an improvement in the cystoscopic appearance, less Hunter's lesions. And then the pain reduction was 64% um, um, after, and it persisted two weeks after um, the device was removed from the bladder. And lastly, um, there's a bit of literature on um, hydrodistension suggesting that it could decrease symptom scores and this effect persisted over almost 40 months. And so this is just one retrospective study that I found. And lastly, I'm going to talk about chronic, um, chronic scrotal pain for which the pathophysiology is also poorly understood. Most, um, so Chronic scrotal pain can derive from direct pain from scrotal contents or can be referred from structures in the same nerve distribution. Most common identifiable causes of um, direct scrotal pain are from previous vasectomy followed by varicoceles or inguinal hernia pairs, metaceles, varicoceles, hydroceles, or architis. But also any organ that shares the same nerve pathway can cause pain. Uh, most commonly for referred pain, there's midrural stones or radiculitis from thoracic lumbar spine or nerve entrapment from an indirect inguinal hernia or tendonitis of an inguinal ligament. And for treatment of chronic scrotal pain, again, very multimodal. First line are lifestyle changes and physical therapies. Second line, start looking at pharmacological therapies, including, again, empiric antibiotics, a four-week trial, or neuropathic medications. And then third line, there's various surgical options, which I'll discuss. Uh, vasectomy reversals um, have been looked at for a treatment of post-vasectomy pain syndrome. And there are three or four studies, and basically all of them said that if it was done specifically for post vasectomy pain, um, about 70 to 80 percent of patients um, had improved pain scores afterwards, and this um, improvement in pain was long lasting. So most of these studies only um, had about three, three month follow up at most a year, but patients, um, if they had improvement after surgery, had persistent improvement. Notably, a couple of the patients throughout these studies required a second um, vasectomy reversal, but often their pain subsided completely afterwards. And this suggests that uh, vasectomy reversal can be a very a durable long-term improvement in patients with chronic scrotal pain, specifically from post-vasectomy pain syndrome. And in the um, office, often to delineate whether it's scrotal content pain versus um, referred pain, a uh, attempt will be used to make a use a lidocaine injection for that, um, but doesn't last very long. So there's um, in some studies looking at Botox and injection into the, spot, into the spermatic cord. And um, not surprisingly, patients um, who had this done had pretty good pain relief at one month, less so at three months, and then pretty much no pain relief at all at six months, which makes sense because that's about how long it lasts. Um, so it's a potentially minimally invasive technique for providing long-term relief of pain, but larger studies are needed to confirm the findings. And going along with the kind of spermatic um, cord innervation causing uh, or leading pain from the cord contents, there are a couple studies looking at denervation of the spermatic cord. And um, it's 
seemed to have pretty good results from the retrospective study with a decreased pain in most patients, about 80% of patients. And again, this um, effect was sustained for this study at a two-year follow-up. And there was one study on ultrasound-guided target cryoablation of the perispermatic cord as a salvage treatment for patients who failed the uh, microsurgical denervation. And this one study found that um, there had decreased pain scores. Um, again, the uh, result lasted for um, one year, uh, which was the time of their follow-up. And a couple of other studies suggesting that um, methods used for uh, chronic pelvic pain um, might also be helpful for chronic scrotal pain because of um, the referred pain. So there was one other study looking at intravesical lidocaine and preliminarily there had decreased self-reported scrotal pain afterwards. Um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about, um, another study going on at VGH for a sustained release um, lidocaine by uh, Dr. Flanagan. Um, so the idea is a sustained release lidocaine injection into the um, spermatic cord might be able to help um, patients with chronic scrotal pain. No results yet. Stay tuned for that. And then just my last two slides. So a couple resources at VGH for management of difficult patients or patients with chronic pain. Um, we have lots of help from our anesthesia colleagues. There is um, obviously CPAS for um, patients who are with known chronic pain and who are methadone or drug alcohol abuse. Um, POPS is happy to um, help, especially in the post-operative um, period and also for advice. And then I think most of us know this, but there's a new transitional um, pain clinic, and that's for post-op patients with um, escalating opioid requirements that are above what would be normally expected or just not coping well with pain. And what the transitional pain clinic does is it helps um, set up a plan for patients to transition back um, with their uh, GP. Another thing I wanted to talk about was that methadone is prescribed for the treatment of addiction and chronic pain. Um, replacing methadone uh, with another opioid is very uh, challenging and unpredictable, so as urologists we probably shouldn't be doing it. The best practice is to avoid missing a dose, and I think recently um, rules changed. And then uh, we are, in fact, allowed to prescribe methadone kind of overnight on the med rec and stuff, as long as it's the same dose. I think you might have to fill, fill out this form. Um, but during the daytime hours, CPAS would be the ones to manage methadone. So in conclusion, as urologists, we can do our part um, aiming to limit opioid administration while still adequately controlling pain. Opioids really should be the last medic medication added to a multimodal regimen and the first one discontinued instead of being the default choice, which sometimes for us it is. And multidisciplinary collaboration with our colleagues is needed to formulate good approaches to pain management and clearly more research is needed to develop and validate non-opioid pain management solutions. So oh, thank you to Dr. Stu, Dr. Flanagan, Dr. Tang for helping with my presentation, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.